Good morning, church family. I am glad to be with you this morning. I know many of you were concerned about myself and the rest of our family last week as we were uh, come, recovering from COVID, but I'm thankful for your prayers, first and foremost, because I believe in our prayers, and I believe that they worked to help our family recover very quickly with very, very mild symptoms, uh, and so many of you were generous with your gifts of sending, uh, you know, whether it was tea or uh, some sort of uncle or auntie remedy that you sent over to us. Uh, we had a lot of coconut water and a lot of things that helped us with our electrolytes and hydration, and I'm really thankful for your care and your concern for our family over the past week, uh, and praise be to God that we are fully recovered. Uh, amen for that. Um, this morning, uh, I also want to say thank you to John for stepping in last week. Uh, man, he did a great job on very short notice, uh, and we are so blessed to have John as one of our ministers. Uh, I am honored to work alongside him, and I think we as a church family are, are blessed to receive the things that he offers in ministry and in priestly devotion to God. So really thankful for him on that as well. Uh, you may have noticed that we're continuing our series on royal priesthood, on the chosen ones. And we've been looking at different aspects of priesthood over, over the past few weeks. We've looked at even how Adam and Eve functioned as priests. And we looked at all these different priesthoods from examples from Melchizedek and Abraham and from Moses uh, even last week. Uh, and so now we can, we're going to continue in that. And you notice that thousands of years ago, God himself, known as Yahweh, he revealed himself in all of his glory to the people on Mount Sinai. And heaven stepped foot onto earth there at the top of the mountain. And Moses beheld the glory of God. And God called his people to function as a priesthood. He invited the entire community to be a part of the priesthood. And yet even Moses' brother Aaron and his descendants became the priests who would serve Yahweh's tabernacle and eventually in the temple the place where heaven met earth in Jerusalem. But from the very beginning, instead of being mediators of God, Aaron, the first high priest, and those who would follow him would choose to make gods for themselves, gods of other images, again and again and again. Their failure points towards our need for a greater high priest, Jesus, the chosen one. And so this morning... We, the people of God, are called to be priests like Jesus. Priests who don't rule by oppression or serve for personal gain, but priests in whom heaven and earth meet within us. And we are the chosen ones, a kingdom of royal priests called to mediate between God and humanity everywhere in this created world of Yahweh's. So come, let us shema together this morning what it means for us to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, the chosen ones whom God has called. And this morning, we're going to look at a very interesting character, uh, someone who is not usually affiliated with the priesthood, and that is King David. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible app this morning, turn with me to 2 Samuel for our first Bible reading. I'm going to read two passages before I actually dig into the sermon this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 19. Second Samuel chapter 6, verses 12 through 19. And it was told King David, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the Lord had gone six steps, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened animal. And David danced before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. And so David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn. As the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out of the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts and distributed among all the people the whole multitude of Israel, both men and women, a cake of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins to each one. 
Then all the people departed, each to his own house. This is the word of the Lord. Let's all pray together. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning, this opportunity for worship. We thank you that you call us to be your people, to be your images in this world, that you have anointed us, that you have purified us, and that you invite us to be a royal kingdom of priests who serve you on your behalf, who serve your will among the peoples of this world. Father, this morning as we reflect on King David and his role as a priest, Father, I pray that you will pour through me the gift of preaching, of story, and imagination as we explore what that means for us in our lives today. This is my prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. You ever seen one of these signs before? No vacancy? There's no room, right? Now, for most of us today, when we, see, we, we think about this sign, we think of like a hotel or making a booking or something like that. And now it's so convenient with the age of the Internet. We just pull out our phone. We click a, a few taps away, and suddenly we have a booking. We have a place to stay, right? Uh, maybe we didn't have it before. Uh, I know sometimes traveling with my wife, we've been traveling on the road, either in the U.S. or in New Zealand, traveling, you know, doing a road trip. And we just click, or, click around. Suddenly we have a booking somewhere, Airbnb, Agoda, you name it. There's many other places there you can find good, good prices, good rates, easy place to stay. And there we are. We have it. We have, a, we have a bed for the night, lodging, maybe a hot breakfast the next morning. But what about when there's no place? When there's no place to stay? I'm reminded of a particular story of when I was a younger, younger man. Actually, I was a teenager, a youthful, somewhat rebellious, somewhat uh, difficult teenager in my household. And my parents thought it would be a great idea to take myself, who was a teenager, my sister, younger sister, who was a preteen and thought she was a teenager, and another couple who also had a teenage daughter, and they said, let's go on a road trip. And let's go across the United States. Now, we lived in Tennessee at the time. And so we were going to go all the way to the West Coast, to California, go up to San Francisco, and then come back across. Great idea, Dad. I'm not sure what he was thinking when they decided they were going to do this for a family holiday with, with several teenagers in car, in tow, for hours and hours at a time. No iPad, no iPod, no music. It was literally, you know, like Walkman. You know, click, you click your Walkman cassette tape, and off we went. We'd use a map that was a physical map in the dash of the car. There was no GPS. We used radio com to communicate because the other car, he was a truck driver in the United States, and so we, he rigged up a radio in our car so that we could communicate constantly because even then, cell phones were available but expensive. And so some of you think, man, that was a long time ago or that was a foreign land. That's strange. So we're on our way to, to California. We're going. We, we stopped over in a couple of places along the way. It was probably day three at this point where we're just sitting in the car for 12, 13, 14 hours a, a day. Because it takes a long time to drive across America, not like here. Like, well, we can get across the island, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes tops? Uh, it takes several days. We found ourselves entering into California. We were very close. We were hoping to make it that night. But because of other stops and delays along the way, we knew, okay, we can't make it the rest of the way. So driving late at night, my father and our friend, Randy, they had been driving till almost like 1, 1 a.m., 1.30 a.m., becoming very late. We know, okay, we need to stop somewhere. But when you know, if you know your geography of the southern, southern California, it's all desert. In fact, there's one town in that part of California, and it's called Baker, California. And I think whoever named that town was very cruel and ironic because if you're a baker, you need an oven. And that's what it felt like in that town. It was so hot in that desert. Baker, California. In fact, you can look it up on Wikipedia. Sometimes the temperature gets up to like 56 degrees. That's Celsius. Quite hot. They've recorded temperatures there. So it's the, it's the Mojave Desert. Okay, all right, thanks. Yeah, so we stopped, just like the battery. We're looking for a place to stay because we don't have a booking in a hotel because we weren't planning a stop. This was an unplanned stop, 1.30 a.m. So you're looking around, okay, all the nice hotels, three-star, four-star hotel, there's not that many in Baker, California. It's a really small place. It's literally just the highway going on towards the other parts of Southern California. Where do we stop? 
So we, we pulled over to the side of the road. My father and our friend Randy said, okay, let's check this hotel, check this hotel, and then we'll, we'll talk back on the radio. We'll reconnect. After half an hour or so, no space. Everything was no vacancy. What do we do? Finally, as we're going further and further along, we thought, okay, there's got to be a hotel somewhere here. In the, it's the middle of nowhere. Surely there's somebody. And we found one. The name of this hotel was Arnie's Royal Hawaiian Tiki-themed roadside motel. <laughs> okay? Now I want you to picture that. This is the middle of the desert, Mojave Desert. And somebody decided to have a Hawaiian-themed, like Pacific Islander-themed hotel resort in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of desert. And it looks like that. I mean, they had like these fake plastic palm trees and flamingos and the tiki torches. It was, it was so kitschy. It was so, it was, it was extravagant, like almost too much. But it was the only place available, and they had a vacancy. And so we stayed there, and it was like a blast from the past of Americana. So some of you know what I mean by Americana, like the 50s and 60s when Hollywood began to be popular, and we had people like Elvis Presley and the, these guys and their culture, and they're, they're what made America famous globally with the Hollywood culture, right? Well, this hotel embodied all of that in a Hawaiian-themed resort, <laughs> Okay, so when we walked into the rooms, and, and this is in the mid-1990s, so this place is 30 years dated from its prime, okay? There were, like, really thick shag carpets. Did anybody have shag carpets in Singapore at that time? I'm not sure. There were these thick green, or at least they used to be maybe blue. I don't know. It was somewhere between bl green and blue, very faded shag carpets. The beds were coin-operated vibrator bed. Have you ever heard of those, the massage, massage bed? You put in the coin and it makes the bed shake for like two or three minutes. It's like vib vibration massage. Wow. I learned a lot about American culture and staying in that place. No room. There was no room. But that's the best we could do. And so we stayed at Arnie's Royal Hawaiian. Actually, I think that place, the, the building still stands. I looked it up the other day. Uh, it's, a, it's an abandoned facility. It's got graffitis and, and there are people that pe go and explore abandoned places like that. And it's like really close to where there was like a prison breakout. There's escape. So it doesn't sound very ideal these days. I wouldn't recommend staying at Arnie's ever. Okay? But no room. There was no space. Sometimes we do what we can because there's no space and we feel left out. We feel like, oh, I wasn't prepared. What am I going to do? But sometimes it's the other way around. When we're the one that doesn't have room for somebody else, how can I make room for this? And we look around and we think about our work. Some of you prayed some amazing prayers in the line of Jonah this morning about your work and your deadlines and your emails. There's no room. I don't have room for another meeting this week. I don't have room to respond to another email this week. But my boss feels like that's all I do. I'm just here to answer his emails and take care of him. He doesn't know that I have another full job description to fill out. How can I make room for this? I work late into the night. I pull out my laptop at home and continue to work. There's no place. There's no room, no space. Or for you students, you ever find it where there's no space in your life? Where the professor or the teacher thinks that their class is the only one that you take, and so they give you assignments as if their class is the only one that you take, but you have five or six other classes and other assignments to do, research projects, extracurricular activities, sports, whatever it is. There's no more room. I don't have room for anything else. How am I supposed to have room for a youth group activity or some other activity that the church has in store? I can't. There's no place. Or what about just in our home? We're on the go so much. I see my family, if I'm lucky, before I head off to work and they head off to school, we might be able to see each other over our cup of coffee. We come back in the evening, we might be able to make time for a meal two or three times a week. But where's the room? Where's the time? My kids have these activities. My, my wife, she has this group or, or that group that she has to go to or she has to work. She has other meetings that require her to work late. Where is there room for anything, let alone time for us? We have to carve out our holiday time just to spend time together, let alone time for God. How can I make room for God in my life? How do I make room for God in my house? How do I make room for God in my family during my daily routines? It's hard to make room. Sometimes it feels like all there is is no vacancy. Well, we're not the only ones that experience that trouble in making room for God. 
Because the people of Israel, from the very beginning, they followed foreign gods, and they don't understand how to have a relationship with Yahweh. They don't know how to make room for Yahweh. And so when Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the Ten, Ten Commandments, what do they do? They don't have room for God. They have to do other stuff. They say, hey, let's create another God. And so they created the golden calf. They try to offer sacrifices and man manipulate these idols. And that's their context from all the way back in Egypt to seeing the other ancient Near Easterners, the Canaanites, the, the, the people that lived among the land. They said, oh, this is, how, this is how we interact with God. We offer sacrifices. He gives us blessing. It's an economy. It works like this. It's a give and take. And so they try and manipulate Yahweh the same way. And it just doesn't work. There's no room. The priesthood, likewise, has become corrupt. We see that from the very first priest, from Aaron, and then from his sons, his sons who offered strange fire and were struck down by God. These guys didn't get it right the first two times. And then we expect them to be able to make room for God amongst the Israelite people. By the time we get to Samuel, 1 Samuel, we see that Eli is the high priest and his sons are just as corrupt as from the very beginning. Having, having immoral relationships there and with, the, with the people who serve amongst the, the, the tabernacle, uh, receiving bribes, corruption. They did not understand what it meant to make room for God. The king himself, the first king, Saul, he was not a man after God's heart. He was rejected by God. And you know why he was rejected by God? It's because in 1 Samuel 13, he does the exact same thing. He's surrounded by his enemies. All of his enemies are around him. He only has about 300, 500 men there to fight back against the Philistines and the other armies. And God had told him through the prophet Samuel, wait here until Samuel comes, and then you'll know what to do. And what does he do? He tries to offer sacrifices himself. He doesn't wait for the prophet to come. He doesn't wait for a priest to come. He takes it upon himself to say, maybe if I just offer this, it'll, this will appease God, and I can manipulate God to get what I want. Let me try and create some room this way. But there's no place for a relationship like, with, like that with God. He didn't have room in his heart to receive Yahweh. And God said, your heart does not follow after me. Your line will not continue on the throne of Israel. And so we wait until David comes to lead the people. And when David comes, he doesn't come as a great king to supplant King Saul. He comes as a young shepherd boy who defeats a giant, not with an army or with weapons, but with his faith in Yahweh. And his faith in Yahweh is molded and shaped by his heart, a heart after God's own. Someone who had room within his own heart for Yahweh and sought to make that happen everywhere around him. He sought God's divine favor first and foremost, not to achieve his will, but to follow what God would want for him. And so we get to this part of our story where we're looking here in 2 Samuel chapter 6, and I hope you have your, your Bible still open there, because I skipped over the first part of that story, and it, but it might be one that you're familiar with. Because David has become, is, is being anointed as king, and he's preparing to establish his capital in Jerusalem, in the city, the city of David. And the ark, what has happened to the Ark of the Covenant in, during this time? It's been in a, in a tent for most of the years as they've settled into the promised land, as the tribes have divided the, up the properties and the, and, the, and the lands amongst their families. Where has God's house been? It's been a tent. While everyone else has been building farms and houses and vineyards and preparing their own needs, they haven't made place for Yahweh. And David looks at this and David says, you know, that's not right. We have this city that we're building. I am living in a house of cedar and I need a place. God needs a place for himself. We need to bring the ark into the city, to the capital city. And so he goes out with his men, with his anointed men, appointed men, and he says, let's go get the ark and come back. But what do they do? They put the ark on an oxen cart drawn by oxen. And they don't follow the requirements and the statutes that God lays out for how they treat the ark from all the way back in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. They fail to meet those standards. They fail to create an actual space for Yahweh. And so when they're trying to carry this, this ark back on this, on this ox cart, what happens? It begins to tip over. And there's this one man, Uzzah, who reaches up and touches the ark. And what happens? He immediately st is struck dead. And we use that as an example of how strong and stern and, and strict God is 
But have you looked at the other side of that, of how the people didn't understand how to make room for God? They didn't follow his commandments, his statutes, his ordinances on how to take care of the tabernacle and how to take care of the ark and how to bring that properly? And as a result, Uzzah pays the ultimate sacrifice. And immediately after that, David, like imagine David's feelings for that when he sees what happens. He's lost one of his men that was committed to helping him do this project. He goes away and he's angry. My Bible says that David was angry because the Lord had burst forth against Uzzah. And then in the very next verse, it says that David was afraid of the Lord and he quit the project. He put the project to the side. So they just left it there at somebody else's house. And David is there, and he, you, you've got to imagine yourself in the place of David. Where am I? What situation is this? I, I'm angry because I'm trying to do what's right for God, but maybe it's the people that don't understand how we're supposed to do this. The, my, my people, the Israelite people, the people of Yahweh, they don't know how to make a place for God within their midst. What am I supposed to do? How can the ark of Yahweh come to me, is what he asks. How can we make place for God in our midst? When we don't know him, we don't have a relationship with him. What can we do? And so what happens? After three months, David hears that the family, Obed-Edom, his family has been blessed because the ark has been residing in that place for a span of three months. And so David says, okay, let's try again. Now let's go do it properly. And so the Bible doesn't say, but I would imagine maybe they did a little bit more research and for, as far as what they were supposed to do. They wanted to get it correct. And so they go and they carry the ark properly on the poles as it was meant to be carried by the priests and the Levites. And they carry it up into Jerusalem. And so David arranges for all this. And not only that, but as they enter into Jerusalem, as they go up into the, the resting place for the ark, the prepared a tent for the ark to rest in, they offer sacrifices. And it says six steps when the, when the ark of the Lord had gone six steps. Now, this isn't just one time, okay? The, actual, the, way, the better way to understand this passage is that every six steps along the way, sacrifices were being offered. Why? To purify the path, to purify the city, to prepare and sanctify and make holy the space, to carve out a space in Jerusalem, in the midst of the people for Yahweh and his presence to reside. David's finally starting to figure it out. But look at how, what he does. He goes one step further because, you see, David, he's leading this procession. The king is leading a procession, and he's helping and participating in offering the sacrifices himself. He's not a Levite. He's not from the lineage of Aaron. He doesn't have any right to the priesthood. And in fact, that was the strike against Saul, King Saul, because he was doing things, he was stepping out of order in order to perform those sacrifices. But here we have David who leads the procession, and he leads it with dancing and celebration with all of his might and offering these sacrifices. And yet we find in the very next chapter that that is acceptable to God. God finds, fa he finds favor with God. David is an outsider of the priesthood, yet he assumes the role of a priest. It says that he puts on an ephod. It's a simple linen robe like the priest would wear. And he wears this ephod and makes sacrifices to purify the city and to purify the people and prepare a space for God so that God can dwell amongst his people. And they brought the ark of the Lord and they set it there in the midst of Jerusalem and when they had finished that and put it in the tent, David himself offered the burnt offerings and sacrifices, the peace offerings. And when he'd finished that, what did he do? He blessed the people in the name of Yahweh, and he distributed to them bread and cakes of raisin and meat. They celebrated. They feasted together. And then they returned home. You see, David was a king. He was not a priest. He was an outsider. And yet he steps in to make a space for God in the midst of the people. And what does he do? He blesses. He sacrifices. He sacrifices and he feasts with them. You know, some people think that that's unseemly for David to do. In fact, in this passage, in verse, uh, verses 16 and 17 and following, we see that 
Michal, the daughter of Saul, who was also David's wife. But in the passage, it refers to her as the daughter of Saul because they want us to be clear on one thing. She had a preconceived idea of what a king should do and who a king should be. And she said, this thing that you did, the way you danced in front of the ark as it entered into the city, the way that you performed sacrifices, that's beneath you. You have demeaned yourself. You have demeaned the office of kingship and of royalty. You should never have done that. You embarrass yourself in front of your people. And she was offended and incensed. But you see, David, he doesn't care. He knows that he has the status of king. And yet he uses that status to create a space for the people, to serve the people, to sacrifice for them, and to bless them. Even though the daughter of David does not, or the daughter of Saul does not understand. Sometimes we need someone to put on the priestly robe and to show us how to make space, space for God in our own midst. Somebody who might be considered an outsider, who can adorn themselves with the priestly robes and show us the way to worship, to restore our broken relationship with God. Ignoring all the criticisms that might come along with that, that this behavior is unseemly or below our station, and to serve anyway. Because that person recognizes there's no place for God here unless I help create that space. It is my job to create that space for Yahweh in the midst of these people. We need somebody to take the initiative and to lead people spiritually, to make sacrifices, to bless others and to say, watch this, do it this way. This is how you have relationship with God. We need somebody who understands what it means to be a, a real priest who creates a, a space for God in the midst of the community, the place where heaven and earth can, can dwell together. Not a corrupt priesthood who serves themselves or tries to make un unlawful gain, but who desires to have relationship with God and with his people. You see, David has this kind of attitude, and he talks about it in Psalm 132. If you look at Psalm 132, this is how the psalm opens up. He sa it says, O oh Lord, remember in David's favor all the hardships he endured, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. David was a man after God's own heart. Why? Because he put God first. And he recognized there were places in, the, in his world, the places in his kingdom where there was not enough space for God. And he stepped in and made sure there was space for God amongst the people. As a result, God blesses him. You look over a few verses later in Psalm 132, verses 8 through 10, and what does it say? Rise up, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness, and let your faithful shout for joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. And we see there in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, after David has done all this, and David says to God, he says, I want to build a temple for you. And God sees that and finds favor with David. He says, yes, you have the right idea. Now, we know later on that God says to David, no, you can't be the one that does it. And here's the reasons why. Because of your shortcomings, because of your faults. But because of this, I promise to you, someone from your line, from the lineage of David, will always sit upon the throne of Israel. And God holds that commitment. Why? Because this man, this king, was not afraid to make space for God, both in his heart and amongst the people. Can we look to a king like that? Can we look to somebody who may be perceived as an outsider, but recognizes there's a place where there's no room for God? We need to, see some, we need to do something about this. We need to make space for God in this place. We need to see the example of David and recognize that Jesus takes us from being outsiders to becoming priests as well. Just like David was a king, he had no right to the priesthood, yet he puts on the ephod. And he dresses himself as a priest, and he serves the people as a priest. Jesus does the same thing. Jesus comes in order to sacrifice and to serve and to bless the people. And Jesus does that, and he calls us as his followers to join him in that priesthood. And he says to us, think about what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, 
What does Paul say in Galatians chapter 3 and verses 26 and following? He says, For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. You have royal lineage. As many of you as were baptized into Christ, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. You see, when we put on Christ, we don't just put on Christ so that we have clean clothes on and that we have forgiveness of sins and we have white robes. The white robes we put on are the ephod, the linen ephod of priesthood. And it comes with the responsibility of serving other people, of blessing others, of making sacrifices so that others may have relationship with Yahweh. God invites us. He says, when you put on Christ, you put on this ephod and you become a royal priest. So think back to earlier when we said there's no space. What would it look like when I recognize that my putting on Christ means that I put on an ephod and I create a space in my work? How can I create space for God in my workplace? What does that look like? What would it look like if I saw myself in a priestly role at my work where I taught others what it means to carry out worshipful work, work that honors God and glorifies God by the way I conduct myself, by the way I treat other people, the way that I help and I sacrifice and I serve and I bless others, even if they don't believe in Yahweh? What would that look like if I assumed that priestly role? Because you see, the priestly role is one for all of us. It's not just for the full-time ministers. It's not just for the leadership, the deacons, and the elders. It's not just for those that we imagine as super Christians because they're always involved in the church activities. This is for each one of us, for as each one of you have been clothed in Christ. If you've put put on baptism, you've put on Christ. And I say, I I would say to that, you've put on the royal, the linen ephod of priesthood. For you students that study, what would it look like to study in a priestly role where you conducted yourselves in ways that serve others, that you honor the people around you, that you sacrifice for those that you serve around you, and you bless them. And then finally, what about our community, our life? I feel so busy. I don't have time. What would it look like to see yourself as a priest within your own family where you offer sacrifices and offer blessings for your spouse for your children. You carve out time. You make a place for God, whether it's through your family devotionals or the way that you interact and serve your neighbors in your condo or in your HDB block. Do you see yourself as a priest? Because that's how God sees you. God calls you to this priesthood because you see for us, we are the chosen ones. God invites us to put on the ephod, put on Jesus Put on Jesus in baptism. Adorn yourself in the priestly robes. As many of you have been baptized, you have put on Christ. And if you've put on Christ, you're a priest. May we learn to follow in the steps of the outsider, King David, who said, you know what? There's no space for God here. I'm going to do something about that. May we first put on Christ. If you have a need this morning, we want to invite you to first put on Christ, put on that ephod, adorn yourself in Christ through baptism, but then recognize that when you do that, you're accepting the role of priesthood. And you look around this world and you say, this is a place where heaven and earth do not meet. I need to make space for God in here, and I'm going to do something about that. May we have ears to hear and understand what it means to be the chosen ones, the royal priests of Yahweh. Let's stand together and sing.